Hey, how's it going? Doing fine. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining. Well, it's a pleasure. What's been keeping you busy lately? Uh, well, a lot of stuff, actually. Um, we've been working on many titles, uh, and recently we've announced Checkmate Showdown, which is a chess meets fighting games uh, kind of a duo of uh, titles. No, not a duo of titles, but, I mean, a blend of genres. So uh, we, we've announced it like a couple of weeks ago. It's been like pre-announced for a while. And uh, the reaction is pretty crazy. Um, the fighting game community is super, super vivid and really um, very thorough on the feedback. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've had our hands full with that. And it's, uh, it's been great working on that title. So that's been my last month and a half, to be honest. I've, I haven't thought of anything else <laughs> recently. Oh, that sounds really cool. Um, do you think you could share a little bit about what Purple is Royal is and how it works? Yes. Um, so I manage Purple is Royal, which is um, a small, we, we say boutique, uh, kind of marketing agency uh, that works exclusively with indies. And even more uh, specific than that, uh, as of now, we mostly work with indies from the Indie Asylum which itself is um, it's a kind of a collective of small indie studios up in Montreal. So we all kind of banded together to kind of share resources, share knowledge, share, you know, uh, a space basically to kind of keep the costs uh, very, very much uh, lower than what it would be if everyone had to kind of find their own office spaces. Um, so we, we do marketing like in every kind of form you can think of from, you know, managing social media, making trailers, uh, overall strategy. Uh, we're working right now, in fact, on, um, you know, doing pre-marketing for titles. So kind of like uh, before even we enter conception phase uh, for, for a new game, like how can we analyze the, the whole of the market and try to see uh, how can we shape production on a title so that it fits in kind of a marketing niche or um you know, this kind of uh, overview of the market and where the, the market is going to and trying to get um, ahead of the curve on all these things. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically what we do. We, we are um, working mostly right now with Manavoid Entertainment uh, titles, which are Rusa Victor Still and Checkmate Showdown, I mentioned a bit earlier, and um, Unreliable Narrators, who are working on Two Falls, which is kind of a narrative exploration game in the 1700s uh, Canada. So these are our main projects as of now, but a lot of stuff all around. We also do trailers for other studios in the asylum. Uh, a lot of people um, from outside the asylum have started like reaching out to me recently because I think we're kind of making a name for ourselves, which is good. But um, it's the time that is just uh, the, the most precious and fleeting resource of a uh, of marketing people so so we'll see where this goes but yeah so that's a very broad uh example of what we do very cool and thank you for sharing and congrats on the um success that it seems like you're having that's great to hear how many games are you guys working on so uh right now i think we're about we're at about eight um i'm saying i think because there's been a bit of uh, movement on there there's new studios that have kind of been created within the walls uh, which are not necessarily kind of announced or anything. So I'm trying to keep cards close to my chest. But let's say uh, about 10 studios all in all. And it ranges from, you know, we have Trebuchet who makes uh, VR games. Uh, we have um, even a studio that really does more kind of what we call serious games. So, you know, gamification uh, for learning and um, for, for businesses and governments and stuff like that. We work with museums and stuff like that to try and uh, create, you know, uh, gamified experiences for the people that go to these places. Also for kind of uh, training purposes for banks and everything. Uh, so you see the range is really wide. And all between that, we got Metroidvanias, we got city builders, we got road likes, we got uh, fighting games now and uh, mixed with chess. So we really cover uh, a lot of ground. And that's, I think, one of the, the key things and one of the fun things about the Indie Asylum is that with the breadth of genres that we're kind of covering, um, we're getting a lot of data on what sticks and what doesn't stick with players and what kind of 
if we ever were to do a VR game, well, we have a VR studio, like it, they're sitting right next to me. So I can go to them and like, how did you approach these, these, these problems? And we also kind of, um, we share resources in terms of, uh, we, we do these kind of book clubs uh, for, produ for production, for marketing, uh, for animation and stuff like that. So people can kind of intermingle and figure out problems together. So, yeah. That's cool. That sounds really fun. Sounds like you've got a lot going on. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's kind of what we're seeing, right? It's just uh, the team's sizes range also from like two-person teams to I think like the, the biggest studio are almost 90 uh, or something like that. So it's like, it is, yeah, that's, that's under the, the, the range of not being that, uh, that small indie anymore. Um, but that's maybe with like freelancers and stuff. I think the core team is more around 50, but still, it's just like, we have all of these people with all of the, you know, various backgrounds and experiences that kind of band together. And every time we kind of bring everyone to the office for a party or stuff like that, it's always like, this big event, like reuniting with, you know, friends you haven't seen since before the pandemic sometimes. Um, and yeah, it's really, it's really cool. As you say, I think, especially in your case, you're doing almost everything, if not everything by yourself. So like having the, the opportunity to just like reach out to people that are like working on different stuff also, I think kind of gives you perspective sometimes even on what you're doing, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for my part, I was just going crazy uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> I think it's just like I made a pretty comfortable space for myself here. That wasn't that bad, but I mean, it was just like the, you know, the human contact, and uh, also uh, back then we were working a lot on video stuff, and I just had a fresh new hire that was like my my video uh, co-pilot basically. And it was just like being isolated was super hard. So yeah, so all of my team basically comes into the office, at least, you know, the, the, the minimum is like two days a week, but most of the, most of the people are, are all here. And in terms of the wider space, uh, it's hard for me to give an estimate, but I'd say like maybe there are 40 to 50 people on a, on a daily basis. Um, but uh, the plan is for, because we're moving offices, in fact, in like three weeks from now. And I just went to the, the new place. It's like gigantic. So the, the plan is kind of bring everybody that wants to come back, back together. Because uh, right now it's even, you know, kind of a space issue. We couldn't be everyone at the office. We're like just too big for the space we have. Uh, so that's one of the, um, I think we're seeing a, 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 bit, a bit of a counter trend in our studios versus what we're seeing in the wider industry. Like a lot of people are like, I'll never go back into an office ever again. Like if you try to hire me and uh, I have to come in an office, I just won't go to that place. And like uh, uh, over our place, it's just like, everyone's just, just so pumped that we're finally going to have space enough for everyone. Everybody wants to come back. But I think it's also the fact that like, we're pretty much all based in Montreal and, and, and uh, rel relatively, you know, small, you know, radius. So everybody's just kind of close by. So I think that helps. But yeah, hopefully we'll see even more faces in a couple of weeks. That's really exciting to be growing so fast. How how big is the building that you guys are going to be moving into? Yeah, it's. I think it's like four to five times bigger. Oh wow! It basically it's an old uh, Ubisoft office that we're kind of taking on. Uh, so, you know, you probably know they're this huge presence in Montreal. So they, they've got like satellite offices all over the city. And that's one of the of their old offices. So there's like nine meeting rooms. And there's just like, as I said, I just went there today and I was like floored by the, the sheer size of it. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to, you know, figure out how to fill it up with, you know, all sorts of devices and the, the VR studio I was mentioning earlier, they've got these, these crazy, you know, sh chairs that kind of move with you in VR. So we're playing like Gran Turismo and you feel the, the car. So these take like a huge amount of space. They got two of those. So we're, we're already filling it out with toys and stuff, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And we're going to have a dedicated um, video space, which is great for us in marketing. I mean, I want to kind of create a, a plug and play space for 
for the indie asylum first, but even maybe for other indie studios in Montreal and around that just want to, Hey, I want to come record a, a video like dev diaries and stuff like that in a, in a kind of more qualitative space with, you know, we, we use like cinema cameras and stuff like that. So like that they could come in and we just kind of help them out with doing some, be it, you know, as I said, dev diaries or public addresses for, to people and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty exciting. We went to, uh, my two uh, video teammates were super excited when we came out of there. They were like, we have all that space, everything we could do here. So, uh, and as, as you know, we made um, a big direct last year. Uh, I, in fact, it was this year. Uh, I, the last six months have been crazy. So yeah, it was at the beginning of the year. And, um, and so that space will enable us to kind of go crazy with it and kind of do different sets and different kind of setups in that space. So I can't wait to get into that. That's going to be, uh, that's going to be super creative. That's nice. It sounds like a really awesome space you guys are going to be setting up. Uh, who's responsible for running this space? Yeah. So I, I'd say like the India asylum team itself, because in itself, it's, um, it, it, it's a team that, you know, basically their role is first, obviously there's just like all of this space to kind of manage and try to make everyone happy. We have food on premises. We have like, um, you know, we're trying to, to, to create a comfortable space. So obviously there's all of this, but there's also um, another aspect of it is that when studios join the asylum, there's kind of an onboarding process. We don't just like open the doors to, to anyone. We, in fact, kind of, a, we have a big waiting list of people that want to join in before it was just kind of a space thing, but now it's just like, we want to make sure we, we, you know, it's the right fit with our, with our spirit and stuff like that. So what the, um, the asylum team does is basically like help them out with, um, you know, you know, finance, uh, finance aspect of things. So just kind of like, doing admin work and stuff like that, just giving them pipelines so that they can better their processes. We also have um, people that have been building out kind of a ideal kind of production pipeline for mid to small to mid sized teams that we're kind of like presenting them with just like, if you follow these basic steps and have these things, um, you know, these software or, or anything like that up, uh, that's going to help you in a major way. So we kind of try to, it's not just you come in here and you work and you do your thing. We really want to try and, you know, empower these studios and like the, the cheesy tagline, I'm not sure we're going to keep it for long, but it's like helping stu small studios dream big. Um, and that's, you know, all because of what we're able to give them as like guidance basically. And there's also, you know, stuff like collective entrance. So we're insured, as a collective so we're over 200 people in the asylum now so it's just like it gives us the power of a you know a mid-sized company to get like super low rates for insurance and stuff like that so um so yeah oh, okay that's useful um how how does it like financing of this work do people like pay a like a subscription or like like how, how does that work <laughs> well i think i i think i can uh I'm at ease to, to say that uh, there's kind of a, it's a maintenance fee basically. So it's not kind of a membership fee per se, where it's like you, you have to pay monthly to be part of this thing. It's more of like we split um, expenses basically between all studios. Uh, there might be some different you know models that come down the line. We're thinking of a lot of ways we can kind of expand the formula, maybe having uh, external members too. That's something that we've kind of been dreaming of for a while because uh, because of said, you know, size limitations that we had before. Um, but yeah, so like seeing how can we kind of bring some of these things to indie studios that, you know, for any reason don't want to come into the space or it's just like not necessarily a good fit. So maybe we can kind of offer different pieces of all the services we do to these studios at um, maybe that would be kind of a membership thing, but we're really kind of exploring options. Now everything's on the table. There's nobody else kind of doing what we're doing, at least in Montreal. We've seen a lot of other, you know, incubators in the, you know, worldwide sphere, but it's still kind of different of how, uh, over how we do things. We're kind of, it's a bit kind of like um, a fleet of ships, like everybody's kind of doing their own thing. But as a whole, we kind of have a lot more 
you know power negotiating power with the the city the city even for you know projects and stuff like that so yeah oh that's really useful um so then have you guys like you guys are montreal only or have you guys thought about working in other cities yeah we're thinking about in fact we're thinking about you know expanding and maybe opening different antennas all over the world there's um, you know there's talks of we have obviously being in montreal we have a lot of uh, french people working for us so there's like this idea of opening you know a, a little in the asylum in france so that people can kind of if you want to go back uh, for a month in your family and stuff like that you can kind of get paid administratively at that place so it just kind of makes everything smoother in terms of uh, finances and all so that's kind of a first step but we've we've been asked to do conferences everywhere uh, around the world about our concept and how we do things and this has resulted in a lot of people being like so do you want to open shop here maybe because <laughs> that sounds like pretty rad uh, so we'll see how that goes but yeah I, we're not ready to take over the world just yet <laughs> we, we have a, a few steps before then <laughs> <laughs> wow that's really really cool oh my gosh think of all the opportunities you have in the different places you could be very cool what what's your role exactly at purple's royal so basically i'm a general manager so I'm the boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very. It sounds fancy, and in practice, uh, it's far from fancy. Uh, I just take on meetings to kind of alleviate the, these pains for my team. So I just, I'm like this meeting shield that just gets everything thrown my way so that they can actually do some work. Um, but no, in all seriousness, so yeah, I manage. Uh, it's a team of um, of five people now. So we got. Uh, two girls doing all of the video work. Uh, I've got um, kind of a brand manager that's working, you know, super closely with, uh, you know, hands-on marketing, specifically on Checkmate Showdown now. I've got a graphical designer with me and um, Hannah, which is kind of my uh, right, uh, right-hand right woman of like, I have a lot of ideas in my brain that kind of like go everywhere and she's just like, okay, let's put this in a database, Antoine, because this needs to be like, so we're kind of like working together on, you know, making pipelines with how we've been doing things because being, um, being in the, in the sphere, as you know, there's a lot of stuff that you have to take on and we've, uh, historically been doing everything all at once. And it's just like, sometimes you, you don't take time to, uh, take down what you, you know, put down what you did on a, on a notion or something like that to kind of keep that knowledge going. Uh, so she, she's helping me a lot with all of, the, of these processes. And that's something like she's, she's been with us for uh, just a few months and just like seeing the, the, the amount of like classification of documents that she does. It's just like, it's night and day compared to how we were doing things before. So I think like having someone like that on the team that can, I, on any creative level, someone that kind of, okay, let's box this, box this in into a category of stuff and kind of enabling you to go back to what you discussed a couple of months earlier is like, it's invaluable. So if anyone can take anything away from this, hire someone that, you know, helps you make sense of the, the ideas in your in your heads that sounds like such a good like duo like you guys can really help complement each other's strengths that sounds awesome yeah exactly and it's sometimes you know that there, there's just so many things going on at once again that's it's just like there's just not even enough time in a week to kind of go into okay so how do i uh put this in a database or or anything or just like evaluating tools so even our you know uh task tracking tools i created something when i you know i took the the management role at the company before then i was just doing trailers but like the task tracking tool i was like okay so this is a task tracking tool we're going to use it this way and like i was using it all wrong because i didn't have time to kind of go into it and the intricacies and everything we can do with it and how we use it now since she she had the time to kind of go into it is just like it's miles ahead and it's just and it enables us to be so much more efficient and like you know do better work uh, literally so yeah it's it's super valuable to do that with all these different projects going on how do you make sure that like releases don't overlap 
Wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, well, first, first of all, so we have kind of two sister companies. So the, the three games I mentioned up top are like the upcoming games from these sister companies. So Purple is, so there's the Indie Asylum, right? And then two of the studios there are Metavoid and uh, Unreliable Narrators. So, and Purple Israel is kind of, was born of people from those two studios kind of like saying, we need marketing inside because we were feeling that most agencies and or publishers we've been working with didn't, you know, didn't do um, satisfying enough uh, amount of work and are just like, they're external, right? So they don't see like production like we can from the inside. So basically all of the titles from these studios um, were pretty hands-on on. So we're gonna do strategy all the way to like, yesterday I was writing a Twitter post. Like, so we do, you know, all, all of this, all of this stuff. Um, in terms of like the, the level of attention, what we're trying to do, and we've in the fail to be quite honest, um, in the past, sorry, in the past we kind of fail at that, is uh, kind of stagger releases to give us kind of a, so what, when this title is still unannounced, there's still marketing going on, right? We're, we're trying to plant seeds of stuff that will grow on later. And then maybe during this time, we're in a big beat for another game. So the, the strategy work is kind of, you know, less uh, involved in the day-to-day -day and the moment-to-moment -moment actions. Um, so we can concentrate on that for another title. And then it's just kind of like looping into one another. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, like, no, at the end of last year, uh, we had a big, you know, a strategy meeting with every leader from all of these studios and stuff. And I came with a slide that was just like me holding my hands, uh, my head in my hands, because like all of the release, release windows were all like autumn of this year. And I was like, dudes, we can't be doing this. We can't have like five games competing with each other too, right? It's just like, at the end of the day, we can't, um, with the level of you know recognition that we have as indies, we can't be cannibalizing our own titles. So that's that's been really a big focus of, we're all already thinking obviously of the, the next projects, trying to stagger them even more efficiently to kind of like give the time and resources to every project when it needs it the most. Um, and then there's also, you know, there's also questions of budgets and also questions of, you know, traction. If, um, like say Checkmate Showdown, the reason why we're so hands-on on it right now is that when we soft announced it, like I just started um, a Twitter account because someone at IGN uh, had played the game at GDC and she told me, oh yeah, I'm going to talk about your game on a podcast next week. And I was like, oh shit, we don't have a Steam page. We don't have, a, we had nothing, you know, basically. So we kind of said, okay, we need at least to put up a Twitter. Uh, the Steam page is going to sadly have to wait because we had to gather a, a bit more stuff. We had to make a short trailer and stuff like that. Um, so we just, you know, started a Steam page, a, a Twitter page and stuff like that. And just like exploded in our faces, basically. Like overnight we had, you know, 300,000 views on a 15 second teaser that we we just like put it out and it blew up like crazy we we don't know how it happened like the tiktok i think reached 1.9 million views and like uh, as of now and it's like in two months but we, we reached that first million views in like two days and we we're just like 20,000 followers coming in when's the game out is the game free is the game out yet and we're like oh fuck so we just kind of had to okay let's scramble and figure out how we, we can you know harvest that that hype and kind of maintain it so we've been writing that um for the last few few weeks i think it's been two months and a half since we stopped announced so obviously we kind of told the others okay you, you have people doing kind of maintenance marketing just like doing twitter posts and stuff like that and the timelines are extending in terms of release so let us kind of focus on this thing because it's blowing up we, we can't just like uh, leave it burn and leave it burning and just go to do other things. So we have kind of that luxury too of being able to kind of, okay, let's focus our, our attention on the project that's really taking off right now. And then we'll focus on, you know, kind of manufacturing this kind of hype uh, once we're in between beats for that one, maybe for the next one, because that's also kind of, um, you know, uh, when we were talking, 
together like at the beginning of the year about kickstarters and stuff like that for roots of Yggdrasil, that's basically what we've been we, we've done like in two months we reached like we ran from a thousand to twenty thousand wish lists and kind of a very big blitz of like Kickstarter events, uh, Next Fest, all of these things. So we were kind of like working in huge beats and trying to kind of layer them in the year between uh, between projects. So right now, Roots of Yggdrasil is getting a, a bit less of a, uh, attention, but it's also okay because there's a bit less to kind of communicate on the project. Um, and we'll be back on it in a couple of weeks. We're kind of ramping it back up. Uh, up to you know the, the the end of summer, we're kind of trying to stagger things that way. But of course, if something is just like you know it's it's catching fire on its own, we're not gonna as I say, we're not gonna leave it burning. We have enough resources also to kind of like okay, let's um, let's put you know this person more over here for a while just to maintain this while we uh, you know say I myself kind of I, I went off of the the more management uh, role of my job. I was like super hands-on. I created this team page. I was doing GIFs. I made some teasers for the for the game because my video team had their hands full with other stuff. So we kind of said, okay, we have to clear space in our agendas for this title. And um, we just did. And I think that's a luxury, of course, that people can't necessarily afford, but yeah. How do you how do you make the promotional material for the things that you're marketing? Like, do the devs of the particular projects just send you assets and you guys make something out of it, or like, is it something else? It's it's a lot more involved than that. I think that's the you know that's the lucky part of basically we we're in these with uh with marketing teams, even though it's the same team. I I, I see that as like most indies won't have access to two videographers. That's like, that's really, uh, you know, we're really blessed to have that, but that's because of the sheer kind of, you know, as I said, the, the, the way we're structured and how we're kind of working on multiple things at the same time. Um, so in the terms of, you know, trailers or even any kind of art assets, uh, we really work hand in hand with the devs, like specifically for Checkmate, it was like, um, I remember Marjolaine, which is one of the, the, the two video uh, editors, she was just like jumping from her desk, going to like the, the, the animator's desk. And it's just, hey, th that feed just doesn't land quite right for that camera angle. And can we get a, a camera shot in engine that kind of sweeps over there so that we can capture that angle? And then we, we would do that, export it r right into the, um, the edit and like see it in real time and just like, okay, it's not quite right yet, but we can work with that. And then, so it's just like, we're super, super involved with the devs, obviously, because we're, you know, we're, I, we're sitting right next to each other. So, um, and we're trying to, you know, step our game up also in terms of, you know, video production, trying to use in camera, uh, in engine cameras and stuff like that, which is, um, you know, capturing is, a, is an art all, all in itself. But after that, being able to go into the, the game and kind of place cameras like we do in real life when we shoot videos, it's just like it gives us so much more creative freedom to kind of do uh, cinematic shots and stuff like that that um, we couldn't do if it was just like um, a very clientelist kind of, you know, relationship where it's like they send us a build or they send us even, you know, uh, already captured stuff now we can really kind of work with them and get a specific capture build we we make uh, often we make kind of a grocery list of things we would like to have to work on a trailer so you know unlocked camera all of these kind of things you know remove the ui and stuff like that so we have odd keys assigned to all of that so that's you know that's a, a blessing to be able to kind of work so closely together and I think um, I think that shows in the work we were able to to do. Yeah. How do you go about marketing on social media? I know TikTok is like a big topic. Everyone's talking about putting your game on TikTok, um, but I don't know. Like, do you find that that's as valuable as more traditional social media platforms, or is it better? Is it is it harder to get views on it? What do you think? Yeah, there's there's two things there. So there's TikTok is just um, the absolute wild west, right? It's just like, honestly, I could put the same, the same, 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 same piece of content 
at two weeks intervals and the numbers can go like from this to this it's just like and and i've been talking to a lot of people about that because obviously it's it's a big you know um, discoverability factor right now it's just like there's so many views on on videos and stuff like that but the truth the truth is and I, i'd be super curious to know like experiences from other people but we're not seeing great conversion from tiktok so it's like the numbers are super huge uh, sometimes you just like as i said you, you you cannot fathom why and then but you don't see like okay i, I didn't make 10,000 wish lists on the same day that that trailer went up in uh, in the millions of views. So there's very little conversion and I think that's kind of a that's kind of a, a, a trap that people might fall into because I think TikTok is very very, you know, shiny right now because of those high view numbers. Uh, but if you concentrate all of your efforts in that platform, I think you might be kind of underwhelmed with the actual, you know, measurable results outside of the platform like it can perform super well on tiktok and then again as i said sometimes you just won't know why which is the worst because uh, honestly i i couldn't i couldn't say there was something like that special about that piece of video that should have propelled it that far i mean the game is looks fun i think like chess meets fighting games is just like something that people resonate with it's just a very instant recognition of what the game will play like even just reading up on it you know exactly what it's going to be like you're going to eat another piece you go into street fighter style combat you you hit each other and then you go back to the the the, the chessboard so i think the immediacy of the um, the concept might have helped but then again we we pushed out better videos than that since then that none of them broke the the million mark i think the most we got is like 240k views which is is huge still but as i said that same day when that reached 20 uh, 240k i didn't see like a massive bump in wish lists or anything like that um so that's that's like the tiktok part of your question but in terms of content what sticks what kind of stays with players i think that is something that we're kind of getting a very very good handle on right now it's just like and i think that's something that people can take away from this it's just like especially on your steam page if you have to make an even shorter cut of your trailer because what people want on steam is gameplay they don't they don't want to um have to like watch a long intro before you get into things so that's maybe a, a good advice like as soon as you have gameplay that's ready to show like before you have it that that's all good you put you know cinematic shots and stuff like that uh, but as soon as you have kind of a gameplay cut of your thing put that as the first trailer on a steam page and then you know your other kind of more cinematic one can be the second trailer on the steam page because what we've seen is um it's really kind of like it's instant If uh, if the trailer starts with long establishing shots, people all almost like instantly go to screenshots. It's like, okay, no, that's that's not what I want to see. I'm gonna go to screenshots. And uh, Steam actually has been changing how they're presenting trailers specifically for that. So now you have kind of the tag of the type of trailer it is. So is it like cinematic game? Yeah. So that's specifically for that because there's a lot of people that you know. I, I'm, you know, I'm a videographer, uh, you know, from from my past. So uh, I love like beautiful cinematics and stuff like that. So as um as an enjoyer of trailers, I like when they're like that. But as a guy that has to sell games, uh, it's not the same because it's just like people are gonna gravitate towards something that's instantly recognizable. Like this is how I control this character in this uh, in this game, and um. Even further than that, right now they're doing like in Next Fest. If you hover, um, if you hover your mouse over a tile, it shows you kind of a six-second cut of the first trailer on the page. So let's so let's say you have like super long introductory shots, or like it's all an animated. And I've been seeing that a lot with um, Devolver titles. Devolver make great trailers with animation and stuff like that. But there are a couple ones in Next Fest right now that when you hover. You never get to the gameplay because the six second cut that Steam makes is kind of randomly taken from the first trailer on the Steam page. So if you don't have gameplay soon enough in there, it's just gonna cut a, a bunch of cinematics together. So 
you know, in next fest is super important to kind of like get people people's attention super fast because there I think there I think there are 800 games in this next fest right now. So like you better believe that if you hover over the game and like it's instant gameplay and it flashes in your face, people are gonna click on it. So so maybe that's that's a good advice on on like what really kind of resonates with player. I, I I've seen even in ads basically like if you if you go straight to the gameplay and show people what they're gonna do with the game, uh, maybe you have like a button up that is like super fast paced gameplay, and then you go into your cinematic stuff. You've hooked them in that first part, right? So I think getting the, your hooks into people's attention from the get go is like something that we we, we don't often think uh, we don't think about often enough. It's just like we want to make something super pretty. But but people at the end of the day are consumers and they want to buy. Well, you want them to buy your game, so you have to hook them like super fast. So I think um, I think that's kind of a, where I'm landing. I'm trying super hard to, even if, obviously my video team are like super into sleek camera pans and stuff, and I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm uh, I'm not seeing gameplay there. <laughs> They're super annoyed at me. But it's like that's the hard truth of it. Like keep that for the cinematic trailer, the second one maybe, or something like that. But uh, yeah, focusing on what you know players are gonna accomplish, I think, does a lot better on every platform. Yeah, definitely. You hear a lot of people asking for gameplay and trailers. Is there any magic formula for trailers or for the process in general? Well, you know, as I said, I wish it was that simple because truth is uh, I, I, I haven't seen replicated, replicable successes. I don't know if, if that makes sense. It's just like, obviously, since we're working on so many different titles also, uh, I, I think once, you know, the studios kind of get into their uh, a focused approach to games that are like, Okay, so the next game is kind of, you know, it's taking a lot of what we learned on the first one, and then we're doing something that's similar but different. Uh, we're going to be able to kind of leverage communities and stuff like that. So, for example, again, Checkmate Showdown. Uh, it's a co-developed game between Manavoid Entertainment and another studio from the Asylum that's called Bad Res Games, which will only make fighting games. So it's their first uh, game that they're going to, commercially put out and then the next game will be a fighting game too so that community is going to be we're going to be able to leverage that and it's going to be maybe the first time we're going to be kind of able to replicate a formula and try it again um, on the the on the very kind of core level and how you communicate uh, to an audience about a game uh, for the rest honestly it's just like obviously what you mentioned about timing your release and your kind of big beats around uh, steam events uh, if you're, you know, if you're go, coming out on Steam, uh, that's like super important. I think that's, but that's not even something that's going to be always the same, right? Because your demo might be something different. You might want to do, um, you, you might want to put the demo out a while before Next Fest to kind of drive attention before you get into Next Fest. Um, and sometimes it's just like production constraints, right? It's just, yeah, the demo won't be ready for that Next Fest. Uh, can we can we consci consciously wait for the next next fest and then release the game after that because that can you know that can mean a lot of things uh, money wise you know so so sometimes you just cannot replicate uh, strategy just because of the fact that production you know video game production as you know is pretty hard to predict and sometimes it's just like things don't fall into place like you would want them to. And that's one of our big focuses right now. I'm working a lot with our chief operating officer, Sam, to kind of like see how we can align production with marketing even, you know, kind of tighter so that we land on the same milestones at the same moment. So say the vertical slice. Um, polished might be a demo that we can put out so that you just like, even though it's at a very, you know, early stages because you want to be pitching that to publishers and stuff. If we publish that, can we give that to the, the public and use that as a Steam Next Fest demo, for example? So then you're not scrambling to make a demo like uh, the month before Next Fest because you're like, oh, it's not a strain on production just as much. Um, so yeah, there are kind of, there are guidelines, but formulas, I, I wouldn't say so. And that's something I've been seeing a lot in, in the space. There's a lot of people, um, 
kind of giving which is good advice i'm not you know i'm not shutting anyone down and i'm and I'm, I'm not shitting on anyone's strategy but sometimes it's just like an article would come out and like do this if you want to make 10,000 wish lists and it's just like yeah if it was that simple everybody would be doing it and the truth is your you know your your good strategy that worked well for your game or even sometimes it's like your lack of strategy that made it happen so that everything fell into place is not necessarily a guaranteed success for uh, subsequent projects or for another team entirely. And sometimes it's like, yeah, it's your 10th game and now you're giving advice. Yeah, but for a studio that's beginning, um, you're not necessarily going to be able to leverage the same, uh, the same level of strategy kind of. So I'd be wary for, you know, if there are young developers listening to this of just like focusing on, oh, this game that I really like and that looks a bit like what I'm doing did this and it works super well for them and doing like just exactly that. You got to keep kind of, um, you, can, you got to keep some flexibility in your strategy, I think, because if you kind of like box yourself in into this is what we're going to do, then you might not see other opportunities arise and you kind of have to be on the, you know, be able to react a lot in, in the in the indie sphere, I feel like, because sometimes some something will just get thrown your way. You'll have an opportunity to be in a big showcase because someone heard of you and then you have to scramble to make a trailer. But if you're like, oh no, but I've heard that it's good to showcase my trailer two weeks before next fest, like you may be just like losing out on a, uh, the opportunity of being in front of 250,000 people. So kind of, so yeah, I'd say formulas anyway, to me are, are kind of, it's too, if it was that easy, everybody would, would be doing it. Right. So I think like knowing how the, the market works and how the, especially the release of your game works on steam and whatever other platform you're working on uh, is like, it's super key to being able to kind of, adapt your strategy between titles to what you're doing now and the kind of title you're doing. Because um, if you're working on projects that are radically different, uh, a same strategy might not work just as good also. So yeah, I, I, I went on a rant there. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but it, it's cool because you're asking that right in the middle of me thinking a lot about this because we're trying, as I said, we're trying to integrate uh, production and marketing like as much as possible so there's a lot of thought on that on like how can we make a template for every project and that's what we're we're kind of headbutting on it's just like there's no there's no fixed template but you can use that and kind of like um, I think if you have three templates and it's kind of a mix and match approach that becomes better because you're able to adapt to the type of game you're making, to the team that's making it, to the the kind of even the tone of how you want to market the game. Because if it's a super serious game and you've been doing wacky stuff before, uh, you're not going to be able to talk to, to people the same way in the same sequence of events, maybe. So, yeah. I know this is a broad question to answer. But do you have any tips for indie devs who are trying to market their game on a budget? <laughs> that's uh, that's a pretty hard question to answer. In fact, I, I would like to tell you, like, yeah, I did this and it worked. No, but um, no, more seriously, I think the the hard part with these kind of titles is that um, obviously, like, and I'm not saying this because it, it's the companies we work with. Uh, I'm not saying this politically, but I I believe massively in the artistic value of every project we take on. And if we ever, you know, if Purple is Royal went, um, you know, outside the walls of the Indie Asylum and we decided to take on other clients, I think that's something that would be uh, super important to us to kind of like believe at the very first level is that, is this a project that artistically we, we think has a, a lot of value? And then, you know, there, there are so many players today that, you can find a niche. You just have to be super realistic about expectations. And I think that's the, um, that's one of the, 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 the things people like to hear the least maybe is just like, this is what we're expecting as, you know, sales number as we're, as we're looking at, um, 
you know, the, the timeline of marketing and stuff like that. So we have to be realistic with that, but still we have to reach these people and that's going to be maybe the hard part of the, of the job, but they're there. We know that this, you know, this niche of players exists, um, but the hard part with, with a project that isn't like immediately kind of sticky is kind of getting to these people. And, if, and we've seen like numbers all over the place with, uh, with ads also, just like, there's a game that outperforms everything when we place ads with it like the ads kind of make organic uh reach which is like i I don't see how that can happen but other projects like the ads are super sleek you're targeting as as good as you can and they just don't convert because maybe these players are not wishlist players you know they're, they're gonna buy the game once when it's out on steam so you kind of have to retro engineer who who is this game for and how do we reach them, which is um, not an easy task when it's not like a super Steam game, like a uh, sandboxy kind of like, um, you know, Forex game or strategy games work super well on Steam and stuff like that. So when you're when you're trying to, to market something that goes out of the, the core, you know, Steam player and you're going into the fringes of, of, of these, um, of that core, you kind of have to, find the funnel to get there like how do i i go from presenting this to all team players to presenting it to the right people and that can mean you know being super creative with how you do things and how you talk about the game and like maybe your the right event for you is not even a video game event maybe it's not a pax west or a pax east maybe you should be going into a film festival with your thing who are more and more accepting of you know video game video game projects like Tribeca, South by Southwest, and stuff like that, which are far more on the artsier side. Um, and then you might be able to get that kind of. It, it's not necessarily going to be IGN that picks up your game for a media article, but it's going to be probably a, a media that focuses on that kind of you know out of the the out of the typical kind of Steam audience and they can talk directly to these people. So it's just trying to trying to reach the eyes of the good people, uh, but it's I wouldn't say it's easy to do. And it's sometimes it's also, to be quite frank, sometimes it's quite discouraging when you're kind of like, you're working your ass off on, on something and you know that the game is good and you know that the game um, would be bought by the people that bought all these other games. Because right, we're, we're looking at the market, we're looking at competitors, we're looking at, how did these games sell on the market? And then you, you're like, okay, but how do I reach these players specifically? So then you kind of like retro engineer that and like, what are their other interests besides gaming? And that's something we've been looking a lot into is kind of like, maybe I don't target my ads to gamers as much because nowadays, like, honestly, everybody games, like every everybody's a gamer. <laughs> it's just like, there's more and more gamers out there. There's more and more profiles in gaming than ever before. So like, maybe you can kind of find other places where you can market your game instead of going to the, the, the typical kind of routes. Uh, it's going to be harder for sure, because there's not a path that's clearly, you know, linking you to that audience. And again, you have to be realistic with the, the size of the, that audience and how much do they consume video games. So you have to be realistic with expectations in terms of sales. But I think like there's so many players around the world and there are so, you know, there are so many good games that uh, there's something for everyone, right? Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not an easy task, that's for sure, when it's not like super instant, you know? Yeah, it's true. It's so hard to find to find out how to reach the audience that you know is right for your game. Those are some really good points to to think about when um, figuring out how to reach those people. Yeah, I'm tr I'm giving you uh, all of this knowledge for free. <laughs> I appreciate it, and I'm sure everyone listening does as well. So thank you very much. Okay, I've got another tough one for you. What is the hardest part of marketing indie games? Okay, my answer is going to be a bummer because. Marketing indies is hard as nails. It's just like, it's so hard. As I said, sometimes you just like, you pour your heart and soul into into an event or something and it's just like, it's just uh, nothing happens. Uh, it's really hard to make that needle move, uh, honestly. And I think like, again, as I was referencing a bit earlier, there's a lot of people that can come in and say like, oh yeah, here's my recipe for success. And that's just not 
you know, that's just not true um, for everyone. And especially when, when you don't already have kind of um, an established name in the sphere, uh, it's super, super hard to kind of like bring yourself from zero to, um, you know, there's attention on you. There's that gap is super hard. And it's just the same as in, you know, social media followings or anything like that. Like the first hundred are like, it's such a grind. And then the first thousand is still a grind and then getting to 5,000. And then, th you know, it's just like at, at some point it kind of, you know, it feeds itself. But the, 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 the first part of it, like getting known, getting attention when there are like, I think there are 15,000 games coming out on Steam every year. It's like, how do you, you know, you come out of that as like the, 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 the thing that is going to work and that people are going to pay for uh, is super hard because the market is huge, but um, a lot of attention is taken by the same kind of people. So I think, you know, there's, there's a, a clear answer as to why it's just like, it's just hard. Honestly, it's hard as hell. It's just really not easy to do. And I think, um, and I think a lot of people also, as I, as I said before, I think like sometimes if you don't think of marketing from the get go, um, you might be looking at, at something that will not be, uh, you know, commercial success, but then how can you turn that maybe in a, into, a an awareness win? Like, can you still get your game reviewed by like four, uh, media that are metric metacritic aggregates so that at least you have a good metacritic out there for your first game that you put out. Maybe you don't make a lot of money out of it, but at least you, you, you kind of, there's a good track record there. So maybe when you go see a publisher next time, they're, they're comforted in the fact that you're going to be making a good game. So that's, that's maybe something. And it's just like, I think that a lot of people also um, want to make the, the game of their dreams as their first game. And I think that's, that's another trap. I'm talking a lot about traps today. I don't know why, but I think, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think the trap is like if, if the first game you're making is the game of your dreams, probably it's going to take you a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, maybe a lot of investment too. And the, the truth is like the, the studios that make it big with their very first title are very few and far between. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a, maybe like doing something a bit smaller or giving a piece of your dream game out there, getting a... You know, as I said, maybe it's uh, the prologue version or uh, just a bite-sized version of it. Like your vertical slice is basically a demo. And then you put that out into the world and just try to make it get picked up as much as you can. Uh, working with PR, working with, you know, ads and stuff like that. And then if it sticks, like, okay, you've just like, you've just gathered already a small community that you can then leverage and then build upon for the next um, the next title or the next iteration of your title. So let's say you have a very cool mechanic in your head that's like so, something like super basic. Um, I don't have an example off the top of my head, but like, but it's like okay, this is like revolutionary. Um, this specific mechanic, I, I want to build um, open world RPG around it. Like maybe just do a prototype version of that and kind of like with blocks and stuff and like some of the games that make the most money on steam uh, are like super low texture stuff. It's just like, it's just, you, you don't, um, you don't have to go full blown, like big production with your first idea. And then you can just, you know, if that works, bring it into a ne the next game. Um, if you made enough money with it or get it funded for the next game. And it's just like, the same game too or whatever else but it's like you're building upon a mechanic that maybe you're the the only one to to do and um and then you can kind of build yourself a reputation again uh, around that right so i th i'm thinking of um there's this game oh, i can't remember the name of the studio or the game it's totally accurate battle simulator i think tabs yeah, so they've built their whole identity on doing wacky uh, physics simulation with crowds. That's like that's basically just a mechanic that they put in a in a game. Like the first thing was like super low texture. They made millions, I think. They made millions with that, and they they've been just kind of doing things that are similar to that and working to that space. So they build upon uh, something that they they've created that was pretty bare bones in the first iteration. 
and now they're doing like stuff that's a bit more ambitious every time they're putting out a new title. So I think that's that's something that that maybe sometimes you have to do a game that you don't like as much as like if your first project is your dream project, you're very lucky if it works. It can work, and I'm not saying like to everyone like do something shitty first, but um, but it's just like yeah, it, it, building upon something is easier than trying to build you know a pyramid with your first thing you're building. You gotta you know you gotta build the the ground floor before building the top of it. You know. Have you ever thought of making your own game? <laughs> Um, well, I've been thinking about it like before I went into games, because uh, I've not been doing this for that long a time too. It's been um, I'm maybe I'm coming up on my fourth year in games, I think. And before that, I was in a completely completely different field. I was, you know, in media for cultural media and stuff like that. And um, and I kind of gave myself because I wanted to move into the games industry. Uh, I was trying to get more, you know video games media things going too but it was just like it's super hard in french in montreal it's just you know there's ign why would i read this small website and you know that's here so it was, i was just really struggling and i was thinking okay so i definitely want to go on to the uh the you know the dev side of things on the media side i want to go into games and like make games with people and what skills do i have to do that And um, I realized very little. <laughs> so like maybe in music production and stuff like that, that could have been a way. So I kind of gave myself the, the challenge to learn uh, Unity or Unreal and kind of like work towards a, a very first game in kind of the span of a year. And again, I, I, I was already heeding my own advice. I was like, I want to make something super small, super shitty, and then put it out to kind of have the the full pipeline in view from the idea to putting the game on steam uh and then i got hired <laughs> to do marketing so i never worked on that project again <laughs> because i have no no time but uh i i i got um i got a play date uh recently you know the little you know yellow console you've never heard of it it's super cool it's it's really like I see a lot of creativity in that kind of device because the games made for Playdate are just made for Playdate. They, uh, some are on itch too, but mostly it's uh, it's on Playdate. And there's just like, people are so incredibly creative on that little tiny device with like no computing power. It blows me away every time I try out a new game. Uh, so I downloaded the, uh, the editor to kind of try my hand at doing something. I, in fact, they even have a in-browser thing where you can kind of, Um, do everything in kind of a tiled way so they have their little engine i think that could be that is made to to enable people with zero code uh, proficiency to be able to make a game from scratch so i'm not i'm not gonna promise anything here but i'm thinking of bringing that idea back it's just like honestly it's i'm marketing games all day I'm reading up on games uh, every night, every like waking moment is listening to podcasts and like playing games, which is like, I still enjoy playing games, which is good. So like, it's been a slow process because sometimes I just need to unplug, but I'd love to, but you know, just the way we're kind of structuring things right now, I think like the marketing side on our end will have a lot more impact on the final products. I think like, we have the chance of having a, a group of developers at the ND Asylum, but also with the sister companies we're working with that are like kind of seeing that, you know, the games need to succeed the name, the game needs to sell. Um, so, so they're super open, I think, and more and more open to kind of hearing out marketing. And I think there's always been this kind of, uh, it's a stereotype of kind of like the dev side and the marketing side kind of like never you know, lending onto the same thing and like marketing promising things and communications that the devs are like, what the hell is this? It's not even in, in the game. So there's kind of like this stigma of working alongside marketers. But I think like uh, a lot more people, in fact, and not just in our space, but in the indie sphere are kind of like getting into marketing and trying to like integrate marketing practices in the, um, in the design of the game itself. So that's kind of a way where I can have an influence on some titles. Uh, I, I've yet to kind of like do my full pitch and try to get, you know, people to make my game. 
but that's uh, I, I'd love to do that someday. <laughs> but I I'm gonna have to have a, a bit more uh, a bit more successes uh, in my <laughs> in my pocket before I can come and say yeah we should make this. But uh, yeah maybe one day I, I've opened Unity a couple of times. I've opened Unreal a couple of times. I'm always like dabbling and I'm like, okay, I'm lost. I'm just gonna go touch grass. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an undertaking. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for sharing all of this really valuable knowledge you have about indie games and marketing. Um, I, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. And we'll talk to you later. Take care. All right, see ya.